But chances are I'm probably going to flub it up at some point and fall on my face. But I want people to see that I'm not afraid to do that. You know, it's a jam. Come on, man. It's a jam. If you fall flat on your face, laugh it off and continue going. That's what the jam is for. Hey, this is Keith here with the Picky Fingers podcast. Welcome all banjo friends or banjo family or acquaintances. What are we? I think we're banjo family. So welcome, everybody. I'm glad you're listening. I do apologize. This episode is a few days later in getting out there than I wanted it to be. I was all set to go. And the last thing I had to record was this little intro bit that you're listening to right now. And I ended up getting sick for several days, womp womp, but that really ruined it. But I figured, I don't know, I better just wait a few days rather than sneezing and coughing into the microphone and speaking with a weird stuffed up voice. So thanks for your patience and sorry again, but it will be worth it. It's a great episode. But before we get to that, I do need to recognize two very special listeners who are the official supporters of today's podcast. One of them is named Denver Lions, and I'm not sure where Denver Lions lives, but if it's anywhere other than Colorado, that would just be a a shame, apparently. But he's been a longtime listener. He's one of the first people who ended up emailing me with suggestions for guest guest artists, guest banjo players, and made some comments on the show. Denver kind of told me he was in the same position as me, where he was searching out for a, a podcast about banjos and couldn't find one. And a lot of you who have listened to to various episodes of the podcast have heard me say that that's why I'm doing this. I just wanted to listen to a banjo podcast, but couldn't find one. So here it is, and I'm glad to hear that Denver was able to finally find one to listen to as well. So Denver, thanks for your support. Uh, Another listener who is supporting this podcast is named Scott Jones. He has also been a regular listener for some time, And he's been sending some great words of encouragement as he listens to uh, some of the episodes. So, Scott, I really appreciate your feedback. Keep it coming, and thanks a lot for your support. Anyone else of you who is is listening and would like to support the podcast, you can do so by visiting the Patreon page. And you can do that by going to patreon.com slash banjo podcast. And you just sign up to make a small monthly donation to keep the podcast running and they are all very much appreciated. I mentioned that both Denver and Scott were emailing the show, giving me feedback and suggestions. You can also do that. And the way you do that is by emailing pickyfingersbanjopodcast at gmail.com. I'm also on most of the popular social media sites, the Facebook, the Instagram, the Twitter. Track me down there and you'll get notices about the new episodes that come out or any other banjo-related things that I just think are cool. That's usually what I post up there. One other last minute announcement before we get to the interview. I know I've mentioned this before on the podcast, but hey, it's my show. I can repeat myself if I want. I will be teaching next week at the Great Lakes Music Camp, which is in Western Michigan. This is the weekend of October 11th through 14th. So like I said, I know it's last minute, but if there are any of you who are in a position to get to Western Michigan next weekend, there's a fantastic music camp I will be teaching Bill Evans will also be teaching banjo, and there's actually a special promotion going on. Any banjo students who sign up between now and the start of camp will get a free one-year subscription to Peghead Nation. And what Peghead Nation is, it's an online tutorial system where you will get to view lessons, uh, their video lessons, from professional players. I know that Bill Evans has some videos on there, and that's like a $500 value right there. So... Like I said, if any if any of you are in a position to attend that camp, it's a great opportunity and a good uh, promotion available from Peghead Nation. Uh, one special thing that will happen at camp is we will be doing a live podcast interview with uh, Bill Evans. Will be the guest for that, and the campers will have an opportunity to to watch that interview happen and and ask some questions. I'm not sure exactly how that will will go, but I'm really excited to find out. So this episode is very cool because Ned Lubarecki joins me. And in case you haven't heard, Ned was just crowned the 2018 IBMA Banjo Player of the Year. So I'm beyond thrilled to be able to have him on the podcast 
and also just thrilled for him because he he really deserves it. He's a fantastic player and a really great guy and just exudes a, a very positive energy and enthusiasm about the banjo. That being said, this interview was conducted before he won that award, so there's there, there's no discussion, unfortunately, ab- about him winning that. But uh, I think his enthusiasm will will come through as you hear him talk about playing the banjo, playing in his band. He's, he's a member of the Becky Buller Band, formerly of Chris Jones and the Night Drivers. He's also a radio personality. You've probably heard him on Sirius XM. He hosts various bluegrass and banjo-related uh, programs on Sirius XM. And he's just an all-around uh, good guy to know, fantastic player, and let's just hear the rest from him. Here's Ned Luberecki, the 2018 IBMA Banjo Player of the Year. I'll address the the elephant in the room already. Not only am I humbled by your banjo playing, but you're you're actually a professional radio host, so I, I'm just here for no good reason whatsoever. You're you're better at both of the things that are happening <laughs> than than I. So, well, I, I will say this: that an awful lot of what I do for radio is also pre-recorded, so it's kind of like making records. You don't always have to get it right the first time. So I can auto tune both of us. You can auto tune us, man. You can make us sound like a million bucks. Put some put some beats to it. <laughs> we'll, we'll be the next hit. Well, I appreciate you giving us your time. Uh, why don't you tell us how you got into the banjo in the first place? What drew you to the instrument, and uh, who were your early influences? The uh, first banjo player that I ever saw, uh, my mother worked for a company, and the guy who owned the company had, and it was some kind of a company party, and he had hired a bluegrass band to play. And I remember still the name of the band. The band was called Coup de Grasse, you know, like Coup de Gras. Yeah. And they were, from the, they were from around the Washington, D.C. area, and it's the only time I ever saw them, but... I, and I didn't know anything about bluegrass or any really any other kind of music at the time. But And I was 12 or 13, and I was sort of fascinated by the banjo player. I noticed that the guitar player was singing, strumming, and that was cool. And the fiddle player would play every once in a while. But the banjo was sort of always just going al- along like that. And f- for some reason, that appealed to a certain part of my personality. <laughs> and, and I asked my mom, I said, you know, I'd like to learn how to play that. And she thought, I, I remember this because it was so funny. She thought, uh, well, how much could it could a banjo be? It's a round thing with a stick on it. What could it be? And she asked the guy up there, and it turns out he was playing a Stelling banjo. This was in about like 1977 or eight. Okay. And he said, well, this one cost about $900. And mom just, what? The, you right. know. But I ended up with one, probably the first banjo banjo player I ever had a recording of was Steve Martin. And it was from those comedy records, yeah. you know, Let's Get Small and Wild and Crazy Guy, and, and those little snippets on there where he played the banjo. He played like a few minutes or just a minute of Foggy Mountain Breakdown. Yeah. And he did that whole rambling guy, you know, rambling, 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 <laughs> that sort of thing. I know all my friends in school had those records around the same time, and they were always listening to the, the, to the dirty jokes. But to me, I was moving the needle back and listening to those little sections <laughs> where he played the banjo. And it was lucky enough to find a uh, music store that just opened up in 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 town. I grew up between Baltimore and Washington and around Pasadena, Maryland. Mm-hmm. And this place opened up and they had banjo lessons. Uh, to fast forward to today, are you familiar with the guitar player uh, Jordan Tice? Yes. It was his dad, Bob Tice, who oh, was the banjo teacher at this music store. And this is before this is before Jordan's parents met, you know, <laughs> so this is how old it is. But yeah. but yeah, it was his dad that taught me my first few lessons. And what were you learning? You were going for the the Steve Martin slash um, coup de grass sound, the, well, the, the bluegrass rolling You know, style. I didn't have any idea. I didn't know anything about anything. And he taught me, you know, out of some tabs. And he showed me a forward roll and a backward roll and all that kind of stuff. And But early on, he told me, he said, well, do you listen to banjo music? And I told him, you know, that I had the Steve Martin records. And he said, well, you've got to buy a record by this guy Earl Scruggs. And I, again, I was completely ignorant. I didn't know anything about it, any of it. Mm-hmm. And when he said Earl Scruggs, later that week, my mom and I were in the mall and at the five and 10 in the mall in the cutout bin in the record 
uh, part of the five and ten. I swear we we must not have paid more than two dollars for this yellow record that said Earl Scruggs on it, and it was called Foggy Mountain Banjo. Wow! And I had no idea. I just bought it because it said Scruggs on it. I didn't know that the glory light from heaven was shining down on me in that record bin yeah. <laughs> at the time, and the angels were going ah. That was amazing. Know? And then the very next week at a yard sale, I found the Live at Carnegie Hall album, and I bought that used again, probably for a dollar. You know, wow. and those two records are still, and I, I, I wonder about it sometimes because, you know, your memory always makes things maybe a little bit better, but uh, those are still two of my favorite albums in the world. And, and I think they would hold up even if they weren't the first two I ever had, but they were certainly two of the most important that any banjo player could have. Yeah, even to this day, that's, it's a rite of passage kind of, Absolutely. Kind of stuff that you yep. were finding. So did you have people to play with, or what was the next step in your progression? Where's yeah, the next thing for me, uh, there was a there was a guy that I met who was right around my same age. He went to a different high school, uh, but lived close by, within a few miles. And after I'd been playing for maybe a year, something like that, I met him. His name was Ken Orley, and uh, he still plays some. He lives in West Virginia, and he was he had been playing just a little bit longer than me, so he knew a few more things. You know, and he was uh, we playing were, banjo. He was playing banjo, okay. but he also had a guitar. And we would get together. I would go over his house. He would come over my house, and we would sit and play banjos together. And this was what was really kind of funny is every once in a while, I remember he had this uh, – it was a Yamaha guitar. And he would play back up for me when I would play a couple of tunes. And then I remember him sort of handing me the guitar and saying, here, it's your turn. And and I don't remember learning how to play the guitar, but I just did it. Oh, from, interesting. From sort of watching him. And yeah. you know how it is when you're teenagers. It, you, you, when whether you're competitive or not, you have a little bit of a competitive thing about you. And so I wasn't going to let him show me up that he could play the guitar. So I, I learned how to play the guitar yeah. on the fly like that, which, again, I'm sure was terrible, but I learned a G, C, and D chord pretty fast. Yep, yep. Yeah, and that's what you need anyway, right? That's, that's all I still know, and it's I'm a professional. So a lot <laughs> of what you play these days, you're just as likely to bust out a... I don't know, maybe not just as likely, but you play a lot of Beatles music. Your new album has all sorts of jazz standards. Was that something that got played in your home when you were when you were learning, or is that something you've picked up since then? No, not really. I don't remember my parents listening to a lot of music other than what was on the radio in the car. But early on... After after I took lessons from from Bob Tice and he got me hooked on on Earl Scruggs and JD Crow and he really he also liked Alan Mundy a lot. Mm -hmm. So so while I was taking lessons from him I discovered some of those players. But I also remember and I was really lucky in this. There was a music store in Baltimore called Baltimore Bluegrass. Mm -hmm. And uh Mike Munford worked there with yeah. a guy named Steve Cunningham and they had jam sessions on Friday nights and I would go up on the jam sessions there and I would play in the jams but they also sold banjos and guitars and stuff and they sold records. And so I would when, you know, maybe once a month or so I could get my mom to drive me up there or after I turned 16 I could go up there and and I would go to the jam sessions and I would buy some records and I remember pretty early on finding a record by Tony Trishka. Ooh. You know, it was Banjo Land. Mm -hmm. And the front side of Banjo Land had Tony Rice and and all those guys on it and was very sort of bluegrassy. The back side of it was Tony with all of his uh, New York guys and the first song on there called uh, it was called uh, You Won't Know Till You Find out had an electric band, electric guitar, drums, uh, saxophone, saxophone with Andy yeah, Statman. Yeah. I mean, it was really, really cutting edge stuff, and and I loved it. I thought it was really cool. I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to, you know. And it wasn't until sort <laughs> of later, the bluegrass rules, right? Yeah. It wasn't until later that somebody told me, "Well, that's not really bluegrass. You shouldn't do this." Well, again, I didn't grow up in the tradition of bluegrass, so. That didn't matter. You know, mm -hmm. it was it was banjo music, and I knew I liked the banjo, and that was kind of rock and roll, and I was a teenager, and, you know, you're going to like that. That's the so. best combination you could have. Yeah, what, what could be better? And Tony Trishka, you know, I, and that made me discover his other records, you know, like his early ones, like Bluegrass Light, that was really funky, you mm -hmm. know. And, uh, and so I... I always straddled that line, and I wasn't afraid to try different stuff on the banjo. I 
I later on, of course, once Bela Fleck became really popular and, and he started playing jazz and it was sort of the cool thing to learn to play jazz on the banjo, I used to sort of dabble in that, but I never had the discipline to become a real jazz musician. And when I think of banjo players that are real jazz players, you know, certainly uh, we're we're doing this thing at the Midwest Banjo Camp and the, the, the guy who I'm thinking of right now is Ryan Cavanaugh. Ryan, yeah. And Ryan, more than probably any other banjo player, really lived in the jazz world. I mean, right. you know, he can converse with those guys. He knows the real heavy cats in that. And he, more than anybody else I can think of, is, you know, can live in that world on his own. And I don't have the discipline or the knowledge that a guy like him has. But I took the same sort of approach to jazz as uh, I like to think that uh, Earl Scruggs and Don Reno took to it because Earl Scruggs played jazz songs on the banjo. Mm-hmm. He just he played songs he heard on the radio. Yeah. You know, he played Bugle Call Rag and he played Farewell Blues and that stuff was pop and jazz music. Don Reno certainly played lots of jazz songs, you know, like Limehouse, Limehouse Blues and that Blues, kind of stuff. Right. And and while those guys weren't real jazz cats either, they heard songs they liked and they adapted them to the banjo. And so I sort of feel like I do that more than being a real jazz guy. So I, I, I learned the song Take Five because I wanted to know what 5-4 was. And I love the melody of it. And I think it's neat. But I don't know that I have any real jazz chops other than I like that kind of music and I would like the melodies of them. And I sort of can improvise over them a little. Yeah. So you, so you obviously had an open-minded approach and you carry that with you to today. Although these days you're playing with the Becky Buller Band, and that by most measures is a, is a pretty straight up grass band. And do you feel like you lend a lot of those influences still to your, to your playing with that? Or do you, do you feel like you have to limit it in some ways to, to the appropriateness of, of what you're doing? Yeah, you know, it's interesting playing with Becky because an awful lot of what we do, Becky's a, a songwriter and she's a she's a world-class songwriter. I mean, she's award-winning. She's written for the biggest, you know, she's written for Skaggs and Third Time Out and, you know, some big shots. And and her songwriting is not always... I mean, it's it's not straight up and down bluegrass. Mm-hmm. They, there's lots of left turns and lots of interesting things that that happen. And it's one of the things that I that attracted me to wanting to play music with her is that that I lo- I love her songs. And she also she wanted a banjo player who was well when she did her latest solo album, the one before the band album, the uh, Tween Earth and Sky album. She had several different banjo players on there. She okay. invited me to play on it, and Ron Block played on some of it, and Scott Vestal played on some of it. Mm-hmm. And so she had material that required Ron Block kind of driving bluegrassy, you know, just just kick you in the face kind of banjo. And then she had material on there that required Scott Vestal pyrotechnics. Right. And when she was looking for a banjo player, she needed somebody who was sort of comfortable in both worlds. And I like both of those worlds. And so it was really fun for me to be able to do that. And it was really the, when it, the first year that I played with her, I was still playing with Chris Jones and the Night Drivers. And she knew she had me on borrowed time. And she kept asking, look, Ned, you know, next year I expect the band to be busier. And and I know I'm going to have to replace you. Who can you help me find that, you know, can can do this? And I started thinking of banjo players that can that can do both kind of. And and there weren't a lot of them. You know, there weren't a lot of people that I didn't. And, I don't, and I'm not trying to put myself in, a, in an elite crew. But, you know, a lot of banjo players tend to find their niche and, and go with it. They don't yeah. tend to say, well, I really like playing straight bluegrass, but I also like playing new grass, you know. Um, but there are, there are plenty of them out here, a lot of them teaching here this week. But every time I thought of somebody, I just thought, well, do I want him to have this gig or do I want this gig? And then I'd think, oh, well. And then I'd think, well, what about this mm-hmm. guy? Well, do I want him? And then finally I thought, do I want this gig? <laughs> yeah, maybe the best person to play like me is actually yeah. just me. And then I thought, I guess if I do want this gig, I got a decision to make, you know. So, yeah. and, and here you are. Yeah. So how did you develop that diverse style? What were some of the things that you – that you worked on to get there? Well, it was, it was learning the stuff from all the banjo players that I liked, you know, I really, I loved J.D. Crow. I loved the drive that he has. I love the mm-hmm. tone that he has. I always loved the music that J.D. Crow in the New South, that kind of, and, and even before the New South, the Kentucky Mountain Boys, I have a few live tapes that people have given me of like them at the Holiday Inn and, and those kinds of things. And it's it's what I kind of classify as barroom bluegrass. It's this yeah. sort of loose feel, this kind of thing. And man, Crow, his playing was so exciting and so cool. And, yeah. you know, the tone and all that kind of stuff. And I loved that. 
but also Newgrass Revival, the addition, well, uh, both versions of Newgrass Revival. Mm-hmm. I loved Courtney Johnson's playing a lot, and I loved Bela Flex playing, and I never got to see Courtney play with the Newgrass Revival. He had, he was gone by the time I saw him, but I loved those records. And then when I got to actually see the band with uh, with Sam Bush and Bela Fleck and Pat Flynn and those guys and John Cowan, that band was my Beatles, you know, to a degree. Wow, yeah. I just I loved that music. I used to try to learn it all. I would have live tapes of shows that I went to. Mike Munford and I would go to the Birchmere every time they were there and sit right in the front row and and just just stare you know straight at Sam and Bela for every note that they would do and I guess since I loved all of that I was always trying to figure out how to do it and you know the other thing I mentioned that music store Baltimore Bluegrass where I used to go hang out Mm -hmm. eventually I hung out there long enough that they hired me so I I got to work there for about five or six years like a sales job yeah yeah just you know working in the store and it was uh it was me, Mike, and Steve, and an awful lot of times we would sit around and pick, you know? Wow. And so I would sit, and an awful lot of times, especially if it was just me and Mike when the boss was away and we didn't feel like doing any real things, yeah. uh, Mike would get his banjo out and he'd have some idea. He just, he'd be working on a song like Cattle in the Cane is one mm-hmm. I remember. And he would say, Ned, grab that guitar. And I would grab a guitar and just play rhythm for him over the chords to a song like Cattle in the Cane. And he would just improvise over it. And we'd do that for a couple of hours, you know, because it was a bluegrass store in Baltimore. Not a lot of people coming in to interrupt us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But but just sitting there watching Mike do this was, I mean, come on, man. How do you get better than that? Mm-hmm. And Mike was another one of those guys that could do the J.D. Crow kind of drive on the banjo. But Mike also had this incredible uh, way of being able to play melodic style stuff and keep that intensity. And he's better at that than anybody I know. And he was, he's been one of my heroes for, you know, 40 years now. Yeah, mine too. So when you're sitting around improvising, what, what would you recommend that people do to Im- improve at improvising? What are some of the... That, that might be a tough, a tough question other than just improvise, just keep doing it. Well, um, it is. Here's the, here's the ability that you need to develop. And, and I, don't, I don't know an easy way to do this, but here's, what, here's the way I describe it is there's a groove that you need for a song. You know, so whatever it's going to be, you kind of get the, get the groove. And then once you put the chord progression to that groove, I can stop playing. I still feel this groove going. And I can stop playing again. And you, if, you know, you're looking at me. The people on the podcast are not. My head is still bobbing in time. <laughs> yeah, your foot's tapping. Of this thing, my foot is tapping. That groove is still going, and I can dial back into it. And then, whatever the chord progression is to the song, and I don't mean this like I'm a crazy person and I hear chords in my head, but I can, I know where the changes are in the song. You, you can feel them in your in your mind. You can tell where they're going. And so when I take a song like that, and I think I'm going to practice improvising over it, I have the structure of the song in my head, and I'm playing it, and I'm going along. And you have to be able to kind of keep that and internalize that, and then just start playing your solos over and over and over again to it, to that imagined band, you know, whatever it is. The other way that I've described it to people is... When the chord change is coming, this is a lot like trying to drive down a – let's say you're driving down a busy city street and you know where you're going. You know you're going to the grocery store, which is a half a mile away. But you know that you're going to have to drive down this street three blocks and turn left. Mm -hmm. So you're you're mentally making all the preparations for that to happen. You're accelerating through here. You're passing a car. You're doing that. You're downshifting. You're putting on your blinker signal and you're slowing down just in time to make the left turn. You know, so that's the chord change coming up ahead of you. You've got to be rolling along and knowing that you have like six beats before or you move to the four chord or you go to the next thing or whatever it is. And so instead of counting, I know I have six beats. I have to go one, two, three, four. Instead of thinking of it like that, you just have to internalize. I know how far this is going to be. I know the distance between me and that chord. And then start to do your 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 transition to that chord in your mind and make your banjo kind of go along with that. And I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's I, the best way I can explain it. I think it does. I've had I've had other podcasts where they say bluegrass happens so fast that if you're not thinking ahead a bit 
it's going to be there, right. and you're not going to be ready for it. And it's unconscious because just like driving, if you're driving on the interstate and you know your exit's coming up in a mile and there's two trucks in the right lane, you can kind of judge by the speed you're driving whether it's better to accelerate and get up ahead yeah. of those guys and you're going to make the exit or to just <laughs> drop back and get behind. But you can't, you, you know, you can't consciously think about that. You don't say it out loud and go, well, I believe if I accelerate at this many miles per hour per second, I can reach the front of 200 yards. But you don't do any of that. You just look at it and you go, you yeah, I can out. make this, you know, or no, nope, I'm not going to make that. I'm going to slow down and get behind this guy. And, and it's, it's natural. And you have to make music be that way, too. So you have to feel where that chord change is coming. And then as you're anticipating it, kind of get yourself in the position and you'll you'll find your way into it. And it's just experience. It's just doing it over and over again. And again, I'm doing it to the backup band in my head. You know, I've yeah. got the beat and the, and the song and the chords going so that if I make a mistake, this is the other thing, is if I'm going, you know, and I miss it and I go, uh, I, don't, I don't do that. I don't want to stumble. I want to go... And if I stumble and I go, I want to I want to pick back up in progress. And I think right. that's the other important thing because that's what happens in real life. You know, you can't – the band doesn't going to wait for you, or they shouldn't. Yeah. You know, so if you mess up, you need to be able to just roll on with it. And the thing that I've told people for a long time, and it sounds like a joke, but it's really true, is the difference between the amateurs and the pros isn't that the pros make fewer mistakes. We just recover better. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, d- and don't make the sour look on stage where you stick out your tongue and act all ashamed because exactly. you and just all- made everyone notice something that right. they hadn't actually noticed. And most in the of the week. time, the mistake that you made was you played a note you didn't mean to. Mm-hmm. doesn't necessarily mean it was a bad note. It just wasn't the one you were after. And if you don't tell anybody, they ain't going to know. <laughs> and that's right. And that's the, the jazz way to cover the mistake, right? Exactly. If you play the wrong note. Just You're keep, always just one fret away from the right note. Run for, or just keep playing the wrong note, and then they'll think you meant to, to do it the first time, too. <laughs> exactly. Well, you didn't like that? <laughs> yeah. Do you improvise a lot on stage with your current band? I do. Um, I think like a lot of people, there, there are songs that we do uh, – that are that are on a record that certainly the kickoff to the song, the intro to the song, I play mostly the same way, you know, 90% the same way every yeah. time because, you know, you want it to sound like the record and you, want to, and you want it to be recognizable, you know. If it comes to a second break or something like that, then, yeah, that's all usually improvised, and especially in instrumentals. I also kind of look at it as my job in the band is I'm the, I'm the banjo player for the band. And my job is to make the band sound good and the band sound consistent and the band sound like something people want to hear. So for the arranged stuff, I play pretty much the same thing. If I'm not playing exactly the same break to a song, I'm at least playing the same melody to it, you know. Yeah. And if it's if it's something that's a song that feels like it's looser and I'm allowed to to jam on, then that's fine. If it's an instrumental for example, if it's one of my tunes, one of my banjo tunes, then that's my moment to shine. You know, that's where I get to be center stage. And I'll usually play the head to the song, you know, pretty close to the record. But then my next break and my other break, I'll just go ahead and do my show off elix if I want to or whatever that's right. in. And that'll be real improvised. Or even on somebody else's instrumental, when it comes to my break, I'll do something, you know, that might be uh, more improvised. But for the for the band material, for the for the vocal songs and that, I tend to keep it pretty close to, to what it's supposed to be. You are relatively well known around the, the banjo camps for not using a capo and playing songs in all the keys. <laughs> and the only key in which you will put the capo on is if someone calls one in G. <laughs> yeah. Are, are you guilty of that? Are, are you admitting to that? Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, is that something that you purposely challenged of yourself to... To part of it is purposely challenged myself to do it. Part of it is, you know, a little bit of it is showing off, of course. Yeah. Uh, but another part of it is, and or at least I hope that people understand this, that this is this is a part of it, is one of the things that that we all try to do at these at these camps and at workshops and at jams is you want to encourage everybody to play. You know, mm-hmm. go down swinging. If you can't make it through the end of your break, it's okay. You're not going to kill the song. We all want you to try. Yeah. You know, we don't want you to. We the the thing I, I hate is to see somebody just wave it off. And 
and say, oh, oh no, oh, I can't do this. Man, give it a swing. You know, mm-hmm. go down swinging. Don't, no three strikes and you're out, you know? So what I'll do is if somebody kicks off a really familiar song or they want me to do it and they're doing it in B or B flat, I can play in all those keys. I'm not super good at it, but I'm, I, can, I can go. But chances are I'm probably going to f- flub it up at some point and fall on my face. But I want people to see that I'm not afraid to do that. Yeah. You know, it's a jam. Come on, man. It's a jam. If you fall flat on your face, laugh it off and continue going. That's what the jam is for. And so I hope that people take a little inspiration in that because it's just my way of of trying something because it's a jam. And that's what we do. Now, on stage, there are songs that I play in different keys without it. But obviously, those are ones that I'm comfortable with. And I and I know what I'm doing. You don't and, take the you know, same risks. I'm not taking the same risks situation. all the time. Although I'm as apt to fall on my face. <laughs> Do you ever still bust out the? I, I've seen you with your Eddie Van Halen electric banjo. Right. Do you ever, do you ever right. get to use that anymore? You know, I haven't played it in a while. Oh, uh, it's. Uh, and I should it, explain that the Eddie Van Halen, Eddie Van Halen's famous guitar, is it, it's kind of just a. a Cheap guitar. It's a Kramer electric, and he yeah. has electrical tape, and it's he, a very he sort of painted thing. it in this really unique style with red, black, and white. It's got a bunch of stripes on it. It's a very yeah. iconic look, and a lot of Van Halen stuff. He sells you know t shirts and hats and all things that it's are part painted of his that brand, way. Yeah. yeah, and and I took my Deering Crossfire and I painted it that way just yeah. because I'm also a big Van Halen fan, and I just thought it'd be funny you know to have a banjo that way. Um, the Crossfire itself is a really really useful instrument. When it comes time to play in a band situation where you're, you know, there were, there were a lot more times years ago where I would get these sort of fill in gigs or these pickup gigs or these other experimental things where I'd get to play banjo with some sort of country or country rock or some kind of thing with a lot of electric instruments and drums in Nashville. And an acoustic banjo just wasn't possible. You know, yeah. you could put a pickup in it and try to play, but it would just feed back. And you could try to get a microphone on stage, but it just wouldn't work. And the Crossfire allowed you to be able to play at full rock concert volumes. And it also gave you, if you wanted to, the option to use all those effects pedals. So you yeah. could play with distortion or wah or all that kind of stuff that you can't really do with an acoustic. And when people would look at it and say, well, it doesn't really sound like a banjo. And I would point at it and a Telecaster or the Telecaster and a D28 and say, you know, the D28 is an acoustic guitar. The Telecaster is an electric guitar. They sound different. The That's Crossfire really... is an electric banjo. Of course it sounds different. It sounds banjo enough. Yeah, it's... That's a really good point. That's a perfect response for people who. Uh, yeah, you know, it's. That, yeah. it, I mean, you know, they want it to sound as banjo as they can, but as soon as you start putting pickups on stuff, it's automatically a little different. Yeah. You know, and that one being a solid body, obviously even more so. So, the, just reframe the way you think about it, and don't think that you're going to sound like JD Crow playing a Crossfire, because you know, come on, it's a different thing. You know, you're not going to win a Formula One race in a Mack truck either. Yeah. Well, maybe if you just roll you over try. all the cars. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you have to catch up to them first to do right. that. Right. <laughs> so speaking of cool instruments, tell us about the the acoustic instrument that, that you have right there. Yeah, yeah. Ah. This one is one that I've had for the past uh, three or four years. It is a... Uh, it is a an RB7 conversion. It was a TB, a tenor banjo. Uh, the style seven is a top tension. It's the one that you adjust the head from from up on the top. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's a lot like Noam Pickelny's banjo. Is also a seven. Uh, this one, the interesting thing, well, where it where I got it, I just happened to go to uh, Carter's uh, store there in Nashville. They, I had never been. They'd been open for a little while, and I just had never made it into their store. And some friends were going to be doing a show there, you know, doing a little impromptu show. And I thought, well, I'm going to go early and just browse. Take a look. Because, I mean, it's a vintage museum. You know, it's like going to elderly. It's, you know, it's it's like, ooh, look. Uh, So I went in, and they had like these five or six flathead banjos in their display case. They had a bunch of them. Their inventory is just impressive. impressive. And so I just asked if I could play them and they were like, Oh yeah, let me get the key. And they just got them out and started handing me banjos to play. And I played a bunch of them. There was a three there that was really good. I mean, it was a cannon. They had another seven that was an original five string. They had something else, you know, a couple of sparkle sixes. And then I played this one and it, this one just gave me that, Oh crap moment. You know, I played yeah. it and I just went, uh Oh, <laughs> you start know? checking your bank account, <laughs> thinking it, about how to remortgage your it home. It really right. did. I just played it. And it's it's one of those things I was telling somebody the other day, they they asked the question at, 
I don't know if it was at this camp or if it was somewhere else. Somebody asked, and this comes up once in a while. They'll say, have you ever played one banjo you thought was the best banjo you've ever played? And I, I just tell them, yeah, it was this one. You know, this wow. is the one. Now, that's not for me to say that this is the best banjo in the world. This is for me to say this is the best banjo in the world for me. Yeah. You know, everybody has their holy grail. And to me, when I played this one, something about it just spoke to me. It sounded amazing. The neck on it was built by Robin Smith, and he built it before I got it. It was already a five-string when I played it, although... That's the neck that was on it at Carter's? That's the neck that was on it at Carter's, but they had it as a tenor. This banjo was in the Sumora uh, book, the the, uh, Kira Sumora 1001 Banjos, as a tenor, and he had it for a long time. Then it got sold out of his collection. It was a tenor still when it ended up at Carter's, and... The Carter's was sold it on consignment for somebody, and they told the owner, they said, look, nobody's buying this banjo because nobody can try it out. You should just go ahead and have somebody build a five-string neck for it, and I'll bet it'll sell. And they did. They sent it to Robin Smith. He built a neck and put it on it. And then within a week or two, I think I played it, and then it was there it went. <laughs> so you're, you're actually more or less the original owner of as the a, neck. As a five-string, yeah, I am. Yeah. 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 Very it, interesting. Uh, and so the banjo is in pretty much original condition. I mean, there's there's all the parts are with it. I have the tenor neck. You know, the tenor neck's in great shape. Uh, it was in, like I said, since it was in the Sumora collection, it spent most of its life in a museum. It sat it behind a glass panel uh, for a long, long time. I have no idea how, how long he had had it. Um, Robin said the head that's on it was the head that came on it when he put the neck on it. So I have no idea. This head could be 30 years old. Yeah. I've done nothing to it. Amazing. I'm, I've changed the bridge on it once, and I changed the strings pretty regular. That's it. Are you somebody who has a strong opinion as to what gives these banjos the magic pre-war or whatever other sound? It does the... It's, man, I don't know. I don't know what the magic is in them. I do know that of this banjo, one thing that I find really surprising about it is the head is really loose. It's tuned down to a G. And I, and I found this out. I didn't even think about it, but I was at a, I was at a festival and Noam was there. And Noam and I were just comparing banjos. You know, he, he had his and he was like, hey, man, you know, we were swapping back and forth. And, you know, anytime, anytime Noam says, hey, man, you want to come hang and switch banjos? The answer is yes. The yeah. answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> you do that. So Noam picked it up, and he played it, and he scratched on the head like that, and he says, is your head looser than mine? And I was like, whoa. (laughs) I didn't even know that. But the thing that was funny about it is my banjo sounds brighter than his. Interesting. Yeah, so, and, and and part of it is the way we both play. I mean, he plays with a mellower tone sort of than He's I do. He's way up on the neck more Yeah, often. he gets a really, um, you know, I mean, Noam has a, uh, you know, Gnome is Gnome. Yeah. So, but even when I played his banjo, when I picked mine up, it definitely had more brightness. And I have no way of understanding exactly why, but it, it was interesting that I'm able to get this banjo to have the head as loose as it is and still get... You know, pretty bluegrassy, but but it also has a nice sort of mellow low end that that uh, that is just surprising to me. And every now and again, and I have a lot of banjos. I have a few Deerings. I have a couple of Stellings. I have a Huber. I have a one that Robin Smith built. I'm kind of a uh, let's not say hoarder. Let's say collector. Yes, and uh, connoisseur. Connoisseur, very good. Oh, I like that even better. And. Uh, and and I'll get them down. I'll get them out and I'll play them. And I'll and you know, lately I've been playing my Huber around the house some, and I put new strings on it, and I, you know, got it out and I'll play it, and I'll play it for like an hour or two or a couple of days. And I'll be like, man, this banjo sounds great. It's really got a great drivey, you know, this or or I'll pull one of the other ones out and think, man, this has really got a. You know, they all have the thing, you know, they yeah. all do a thing, and then I'll play it and I'll think, boy, did I make a mistake, you know, buying spending all that money on that other one, and then I'll go pick it up, uh, you know, out of its case, and I'll pick it up. And just go, and I'm like, nope, nope. It's, uh, it's worth every penny. I oh, did the right fantastic. thing, you know. So I'm really, really happy with this banjo. Uh, and people will ask, does the top tension make a difference? Does this make a difference? And I'm sure the answer is yes, but I can't quantify what about it. You know, it, it's just this instrument. You know, every instrument that you pick up has got something to it, and who knows which feature of it, it adds to that it, it's all just a combination of features and the way it's put together yeah it, it, it's not not something that easy to just recreate elsewhere yeah something that's been 
tickling my brain is how much of an impact just the resonator has on those top tensions because oh, they're yeah. different. For example, yeah. if I were to take that off of yours and put it on a, a different one, do you do you have any experience with just swapping resonators? You know, I've I've done that. It's been a while since I tried this. On I, I don't know if I've done it on this banjo, but I've I've seen it done. You know, trying out different resonators on them. And and the thing for people that don't know, uh, the top tension banjos, in order to make up for the extra weight of that uh, brass hoop around the top with all the extra you know hardware, they made a much heavier, thicker, solid wood resonator. <laughs> <laughs> so when people pick them up and they say, "Oh, those are so heavy," it must be that tension hoop. Well, it's also the resonator on those things. Mm-hmm. What they are, if you look at the back of them, it has like a little cur- carve uh, curved to it, like a mandolin top. But the inside of them is flat, and it's because the back of it is made of solid wood. Most resonators are plywood and kind of curved, and these are solid. So it's like, I don't know, a half an inch maybe, maybe three quarters of yeah, an inch hefty. thick in the middle. Yeah. So it's a big piece of solid wood. But I can feel that, and I know that, and I, and I don't know the flat shape of it, I'm sure, changes the internal you know, sound yeah, of the it acoustics some, or something. Yeah. But also the fact that it's made out of solid wood, I, I sort of, you can hold on to it and feel it. And the plywood ones you can too, but there's, I, I'm sure there's something to the resonance of the solid wood that, that makes it different. And yeah. different is all I'll really go to. I mean, better and worse is for other people to decide, but I'm sure it makes a difference. And it's, it's just another thing for us banjo geeks to rip our hair out it trying is. to figure out. And I, I will say this, this was uh, really funny, is uh, it came with a clamshell tailpiece, you know, mm-hmm. which is the kind, it's a little spring-loaded thing on it, and it's the original, so it has a hole drilled in it for the for the fifth string, and, and you have to double up on one of the hooks, you know, to because uh, it only has four yep, hooks. Yep. And, and I remember this was at IBMA a couple of years ago. Bill Evans, I think, was just arriving at the hotel, and Noam was in the in the lobby, and we were all three sort of just talking, you know. And Noam said something about his banjo, and Bill said something about his banjo, and Bill said something about having taken the clamshell tailpiece off of his and putting on a Presto just to try it out. He said, yeah, put a Presto on, you know, to, to give it a whatever. And Noam kind of piped up, and he said, and I loved this, he said, I've been loyal to the clamshell for over eight years. <laughs> and when I heard that... I I knew that I could never, I, I could never disavow my loyalty to the clamshell. <laughs> you must bow before it. <laughs> <laughs> Loyal to the clamshell. I mean, come on. That, yeah, <laughs> that needs to be a bumper sticker, <laughs> or at least put it in the. The case with any banjo that that's it. That I've been loyal to clam the clam shell. shell. No one Yeah, <laughs> I have to call him out on that if I see him. Oh please. Um, what about microphones? I, I'm sound guy here. I, I'm a bit of a geek, and you have such a special instrument. Do you have any preferences for how it gets any old, recorded or live? Any old KM84 will do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got a few here in my pocket. Right. This is, this is the dumbest thing. We have our own sound man that we travel with, and since we have our own sound man and our own in-ear monitor rig, we can get away with whatever we want on stage, because mm-hmm. you know that uh, having a lot of different Diverse microphones, especially, you know, condenser microphones can create a lot of feedback problems on on a festival stage, especially if you're if it's not the stuff you're using all day. If the place just has a bunch of 57s and 58s up there, that can create. So having in-ear monitors allows you to get away with a lot more without feedback. And since we're bringing all this gear anyway, our guitar player had a pair, a matched pair of KM84s, which is a vintage Neumann, you know, little pencil condenser yeah. microphone. He had a pair of them, and whenever I would step over to his mic, I really kind of liked it better than the mic I was using, yeah. so I bought one. <laughs> so yeah, I use a KM84 on stage. In the studio, there's a couple different mics that I've really liked on this banjo. Uh, I've recorded at Ben Surratt's studio, and he's got a... It's it's a... It's an off model of the, of the AKG C414. It's a... Hmm. BXL Tour, it's something, it's one that they don't make anymore, and I don't know exactly what the difference is, but it's not the straight 414. It's a, it's a, it's a different one that he's used on banjo for a long time, and I've been real happy with that. Stephen Mojin has a mic tech. I think it's a tube mic. Is it the it might be the C4. Uh, it's a big one, big, tall tube mic that uh, we, when we made the Becky Buller album, I got there to his studio, you know, a couple hours before everybody else because Stephen just wanted to do a shootout. He just wanted to try. And we tried, we tried maybe like eight or ten microphones on the banjo, and that one was clearly in that room through his preamp. That one was 
the one that just knocked us out. So I know there's a real sought after one called a C12, but I'm by no means an authority. So who yeah, knows? They're, they're, the C12 C4. was the AK, AKG. Uh, the, the C4, I think, is the one that that uh, that Mike Tech is making. Mike Tech is a company in Nashville that's making you know studio mics and stuff, and they have a whole line. And I think that's the one it is. It's a it's a tall microphone uh, with a tube inside it. You know, it's one of those. Uh, but it uh, it on at least on that record, if you listen to the Becky Buller, the new one, the Great Paper Heart record, that's, that's the, the one, one we on used there. on it, and and it sounded really good. I, I was really pleased with the way it came out. Well, uh, congratulations. You, I, I view you as kind of a prototype example of how to make a living playing the banjo because you, you have your performing, you have your <laughs> radio show, you, you write instructional books. Yeah. So uh, I, I think you're really setting the tone. Oh, man, thanks. You know what? I have, to, I have to speak to that also because I remember as a young banjo picker, uh, first getting into it and and sort of I don't know that I ever really knew that I was going to do this but I, I you know certainly had dreams of it I would look at my heroes like Tony Trishka and JD Crow and and Pete Wernick and all those guys and and I think I I recognized early on that Tony Trishka aside from going out and playing and making records he also taught these workshops and he also had a bunch of books for sale and Pete Wernick of course had his book for sale and and then started doing the camps and when I when I saw that I think I somehow rationalized that there must not be a big living in playing one of these things <laughs> so you better be able to do a couple of different things yeah a couple, and, of, uh, couple of revenue streams and on. I also I remember going to a Tony Trishka workshop when I was a teenager and an Alan Mundy workshop and early on I'd only been playing a couple of years when my teacher quit uh, the job at the music store. He actually went to school for something else. And the store called me up to ask if I would teach. And I told him, I said, well, I've only been playing a couple of years and I'm just a kid. You know, you, surely you can find somebody better. And they said, no, you were his best student. You were the guy, you know, we need somebody and you're the only one we know. Can yeah. you do it? And I kind of did it partly out of, I just felt like I needed to pay it forward because I was so glad somebody yeah. was there when I wanted lessons that I thought, well, they need somebody. I, mean, I guess yeah. I better do it. But I think that made me a better player. And it was a learning curve to learn how to teach. But when you start teaching somebody else, you have to really analyze what you're doing. Because even though you know how it's supposed to be, you might not be doing it right. So then yeah. you have to do it right to show them how to do it right. And that got me started teaching pretty early on. And and when I saw like a banjo workshop by Alan Mundy and by Tony Trishka, both of those guys I think are – I mean they're, they're both enormous heroes of mine as players. And, and I'm still a little mind blown that, that now they're my friends. You know, Now yeah. I get to – I can call those guys up. We hang out and it's – and I, I still feel really a little fanboy about that. But they were also big heroes of mine as teachers because they had this ability of being able to explain some really difficult concepts – to uh, to students without going over their heads and and that's a skill that I've been developing for 30 years you know I mean it's yeah. it's a they're so good at doing that and that was a big inspiration too yeah that's amazing did you do any radio prior to your your current show yeah I worked in a couple of different radio stations on and off since the early 90s it wasn't until I started working for Sirius now Sirius XM that I ever played bluegrass on the air I, wow. I played rock and roll, country music. I had a gospel music show at one point. I worked for a news talk station. I did a few different things in radio and never, never played bluegrass. Well, I'm glad you finally get to that. Must, yeah, that must yeah. Be I, really I, cool. I was waiting for satellite to come along before I really wanted to commit to it. <laughs> uh, Any time now. Any day. <laughs> Tell everybody how to check out your playing, how to look at your tour schedule, your products online. How do they? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, it? you can find me at nedski.com. Come to nedski.com. That's N E D S K I dot com. Was Ned Toboggan already taken? Ned Toboggan. Oh, yeah, nice. Dang. Yeah, very That's good. Ned. Nedski came from, it was a nickname in the Boy Scouts, I think, because the real Polish pronunci pron pronunciation, see, I'm a professional at this, uh, of Luberecki is Luberecki. So Ooh. Nedski. Yeah, yeah, I'm a ski after all. Wonderful. Yeah. 
It's been a pleasure, Ned. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Keith. Thanks a lot for doing this. Yeah, man, thanks. And that's going to wrap up the conversation with the 2018 heavyweight banjo champion, Ned Luberecki. Congratulations again to him. Thanks again to Denver Lions and Scott Jones. They are the supporters of the podcast. Go to patreon.com slash banjo podcast if you'd like to become a supporter or contact me at pickyfingersbanjopodcast at gmail.com with any other comments or questions. If you want to come take banjo classes with either me or Bill Evans next weekend in Michigan, go to greatlakesmusic.org for the Great Lakes Music Camp that I'll be teaching. Other than that, that's going to do it for me. I'm going to get to work on the next episode. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next time.